so today's lecture is we're going now sort of back to where I said we should have been at the beginning of the semester. Now start talking about concurrency control and transactions and updates to the data system. Right. So last class I said that I did query compilation uh, at the very beginning because I think it's something that's important that we should focus on at the beginning, but it's it doesn't really fit into the flow for the rest of the semester. But because you needed this for the first project, because this is going to be something that you're going to encounter all throughout the semester, I pushed it to the front. And then now we're switching over to where I normally go through in the semester and start talking about concurrency control and transactions. So some quick administrative things. Uh, project one is due tonight at midnight. Um, I know there is one particular issue we're having with Clang format, uh, but we'll take care of that. Uh, when you get the grading. And then project two will be released on this Wednesday coming up. So for this project, you want to be in groups of three three people because uh, it's going to take about a month or so to work on it. And then this will end up being probably the same group you're going to do for the third project or the final project. So choose your group wisely. Uh, so I'll send out a sign-up sheet on Piazza. We can go on to uh, a Google spreadsheet and fill out who the, the Android is for the people within your group. If you don't have a group, uh, there'll be like a free agent list where you just sort of add yourself there and then come Wednesday if you can't find a, a group to be in I'll just start uh, pairing people together. Okay, so again, this is gonna be working with them throughout the entire semester So so try to pick somebody who you think you can get along with right last last year We had fights and I had to break people up. So that was never good the year before we had somebody with hygiene problems I had to figure out who to who smelled the worst this, and who smelled the second worst to put those people in the same group so they didn't bother everyone else. So I, I'd like to not do that, so hopefully you guys can resolve this yourself, okay? The uh, a next sort of announcement as well is that uh, now that every, you know, we've sort of gotten past the ad drop deadline and everyone that wants to be in the course is in the course, uh, I want to announce that if you want to go beyond the things that we're talking about in, in this class, uh, there's two opportunities to, to get involved in other things outside of, of the course. So the first is that the, the, the CMU database group will have their weekly meetings on Wednesdays, or sorry, Mondays at 4.30, immediately after this class, up on the uh, eighth floor. And so for this, it's just my students and other researchers at CMU will come and talk about you know, the various research projects they have going on related to, to databases. So we're actually having a, a speaker today. We'll be presenting uh, his paper on the BW tree, which is one of the papers that you guys be assigned reading in, in two weeks. The other thing is that we also have our Peloton developer uh, team meeting on uh, Tuesdays at 12 p.m. In, uh, this, on the seventh floor. And this is basically where we don't really talk about core research stuff. We talk about the, the ongoing development of, of our system. What are the bugs we have? What are the main features we're trying to build? And, you know, and everyone can sort of get involved and, and help out if you want to go beyond the stuff we have in the course. Okay? So again, both of these are entirely optional. I'm just sort of saying that these are things that if you want to sort of go beyond the things we, that we're going to discuss in the course and the paper or in, in the papers in the classes, and then you want to get, maybe get involved in a research project, uh, these are two opportunities to, to, to enlighten yourself. Okay? And again, they're, they're entirely optional. And there'll be food at, the, at this one. There's cookies at this one, food at this one, and everyone loves food, right? All right. So for today's agenda, uh, I'm going to start off talking about some background material. So I've been sort of debating for the last couple of years as I teach this course to try to figure out what's the right flow, the right order for me to explain topics related to concurrency control. Because there's a bunch of background stuff that you're not necessarily going to get from an intro class that I think is important. Uh, but I don't want to have a class that's just all, you know, all intro material because there's no paper you can, you, you can read. Uh, so what I'm going to do instead is sort of, sort of the next three lectures will be on concurrency control. And I'll sort of present a little vignettes or a little off, off side, side things about you, what you need to know in modern concurrency control or modern transaction processing that are relevant to our discussions. Um, and then I'll talk about the main thing that, for the paper that you guys read. So today I'm going to start off talking about stored procedures. And then we'll get into uh, OCC, the optimistic concurrency control algorithm that you, you, uh, that you guys read about. And then we'll read about modern implementations of this. So silo is a modern implementation. And then TikTok is the other one that we'll focus on, OK? All right, so at the beginning of the semester, we said that one of the big things that we're going to do in, in, the, in a modern database management system is forego having to store anything on disk and switch to an entirely a main memory-oriented or architecture. So that means now, since the database is no longer stored on disk, we're not going to have any stalls from transactions when they try to go read data, 
right? Everything's going to be main memory, but everything's going to be really, really fast. And because of this assumption about our architecture, this allows us to reevaluate how we want to design our, our data management systems components. Right? Concurrent control is just one aspect of this, but there's other things we can do uh, as well to, to, to speed up processing, speed up execution. But just because we got rid of the disk, and we didn't get rid of the disk entirely, and we still have to care about logging and writing out records when, about changes that transactions make to disk, right? that doesn't go away. But for our purposes, we'll ignore that for now, and we'll cover that later in the semester. But just because we got rid of disk from, from page faults, from, from reading from tuples that aren't in memory, there's still other stalls that we're going to have while we process transactions that we can't get rid of. And the one that's going to be the, that's most relevant to our discussion for concurrent control here is the network. So someone posted on Piazza asking about, uh, it seems like in all these papers, they're ignoring what the cost it is for sending messages over the network. Uh, and this is true, but I'm not going to focus on inter to inter node communication for like, as you would have in a distributed database system. I really care about the, the, the messages that the application server sends to the database server to execute queries and execute transactions, right? Because now if the disk is gone, our transactions are super fast, the next high pull in the tent, the next bottleneck we're gonna have to deal with is actually gonna be the network. So these stalls are gonna come from applications that are written using what is called a conversational style API, right? So examples of this would be like ODBC or JDBC or like the, you know, the, the database specific wire protocol that, that the system supports. Like when you open up the PSQL terminal and connect to Postgres, right? when you type your query and hit enter, that's the conversational API. That's, that's sending requests from the application side or the client to the database server. The client then waits for the database server to send back a response with the result of that query. Right? So now when you're doing transactions, it, this, is, becomes, this becomes problematic. Right? So say we have uh, an application server and our database server, and they're running on separate machines, for our purposes, we don't care. This could be run on the same rack or the same data center or on another data center. It doesn't matter. We still can have the same problem. And the application wants to invoke some higher level method in, the, in, in, its, in its code to perform some higher level operation in, 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 on behalf of a user. Right? So we're not talking about a single query. We're executing a transaction here that's going to do some higher level thing like add something to your cart, update your payment information. And so, the, the application server is going to hit some, some, you know, it'll get some user requests, needs to start executing this transaction. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to call begin, to say I need to, I'm going to open up a new transaction. Depending on what the protocol is or how it's actually implemented, you may or may not have to send a, a network message for this begin. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. And then we start a transaction and we, and we get the first query we want to execute. And so what's going to happen is the application server is going to, going to you know, there'll be a command to say execute the SQL query, and that's going to go over the network using whatever the, the protocol actually is, land on the database server, and then this application server thread is going to block because it has to wait until it gets back the response. It can't keep processing because it didn't know what the result of that query was. So when the query lands on the database server, there's a bunch of stuff we have to do before we actually even can execute it. Right? So we have to parse the SQL, convert it into a bunch of tokens and abstract syntax tree, then we're going to run it through the planner and the binder, and that's where we take the, you know, the, the names of tables and do lookups in the catalog and find the catalog objects. Then we run it through the query optimizer that's going to actually convert it to the logical plan to a physical plan, right? maybe optimize it if we're doing joins, and then we can actually execute the query. And then when we get the result of the query, then we can send it back to the, the application with the result. Now at this point here, the, the database server is going to, is going to wait to figure out what the next query is that this transaction is going to execute. So it's not really stalled, right? Other transactions could be executing queries at the same time. But for this particular transaction that we started, we have to maintain all the metadata about what it actually did and its, and its read-write set and everything uh, in, in anticipation of it sending the next query. So that means that if we're, if we're grabbing locks for this transaction, we're holding those locks for, for why we're going back and forth between the application server and the network or the application server and the database server over the network. So then we get a result here, then it can do some processing, executes the next SQL query, same thing, you send a message, you block, get, and then send a result back, and then again, we're still waiting for the next query or the next result from, from this transaction. Then at some point, we, uh, we get our commit message, then we send uh, that, that message over to the, to the database server. It can then finally check to see whether this transaction is allowed to commit, right? do some validation process, 
And if it does commit, then it can write out the log and then release all the locks or whatever else that it was maintaining for the database server. Right? So here the problem is, again, it's the, the transaction itself may actually be really, really fast. These queries are usually pretty simple, like look up a key, update a record based on its key. Right? We're not doing large, large updates typically in transaction processing workloads. So the queries are going to be really fast, but the, it's the network traffic that's, that's going to kill us. The, in terms of like the parser planner optimizer part, that, you know, that's not a huge bottleneck, but that can be slow if your queries are really, really simple. And so when the NoSQL guys came out, they basically said, we want to get rid of all these things and just have the application be written using the, the database system, you know, uh, API commands on, on, on the, on, you know, to execute queries on the, on, the, on the database server rather than having to deal with SQL. So what are some solutions we can have to this problem? Well, the first is that we can use prepared statements. We can tell the data system ahead of time, hey, here's the queries I'm going to execute. And here's, here's little uh, placeholders where I'll, I'll give you values if, if you want to substitute uh, constants uh, when I invoke it. Right? So this moves, removes all that preparation overhead that I said before, where you don't have to parse the SQL and plan it and optimize it every single time you invoke it. You generate the query plan, cache it, and then you invoke that prepared statement by, by based on name, and then you avoid that all that, that upfront cost. Um, these, these definitely help, but I would say most applications are not written using prepared statements. Uh, most applications are written using what is ad hoc SQL. Right? You construct the SQL string in your PHP code, and then you, then you invoke it. Um, and the next solution is to use batches. So instead of sending one query, get back results, send the next query, get back the result. You can try to combine multiple queries in, into a single request, send those over the network, do all the processing, and get back multiple results. Right? And that, again, that avoids the round trips. You can't always do this because sometimes the, app, the, the application we've written such that the output of one query can be used, needs to be used as the input for the next query. So you have to see what that output is before you can figure out how to construct the next, the next query you want to send. Um, you can kind of finagle it maybe with nested queries to try to avoid this, but there are also be cases where the application server will get the output of one query, then it has in the actual application code itself an if clause that says, if the output is this, execute that query. If the output is something else, execute this other query. So for that, you have to get back the result, and you can't execute everything in batches. But the one we're going to focus on uh, here real quickly is store procedures. And the idea with store procedures is that we're going to take all the application logic that was running on the application server, the program logic, we're actually going to embed that directly inside the database system. And then no longer do we have to do this back and forth, get a query result, process it, get a next query result, process it. Uh, we can now make a single request, almost like an RPC call, into the database server to execute that single function. It executes all on the server side, and we get back a single result. All right? So the way I think with store procedure, again, it's, it's a logical unit in the application code that's going to perform uh, some particular task on behalf of the application that would normally be written in the application, but instead we're going to embed it inside the database server. So there is actually a, 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 store, a, a standard defined store procedure programming language that you're, everyone's supposed to use called SQL PSM, but nobody actually implements the standard directly, right? Uh, like so, this first came out in like SQL 92 or so. They were sort of proposing, or uh, it actually came out a little bit after the SQL 92 standard came out, um, and then it was actually ratified in SQL 99. So it's been around for a while, but nobody actually implements it exactly as as it is. Uh, the most common implementation is what's called PL SQL, uh, and again, at a high level, it looks very close, but the, the sort of the nitty gritty details deviate from the the standard. And this is what Oracle, DB2, and MySQL use. I think this is MySQL 8 has this. Postgres has something called PLPG SQL. Again, I, I don't know the exact details of where it, it, it differentiates between PL SQL, but there are some, some Postgres idioms in there that make it not 100% compatible. And then Microsoft has this thing called Transaction SQL, or T-SQL. Uh, this actually came from Sybase from the 1980s, 1990s. Remember that I said the SQL server code is actually originally based on, on Sybase. Um, and they, 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 they originally ported Sybase to Windows NT, and then since then they've deviated so much. But they still, uh, they still maintain the support or from the inheritance of the, the Transact SQL, the stuff they got from Sybase. Right? So you can, definitely cannot take Transact SQL and run it in these other guys. So again, the high-low idea is that we're taking all that same application code we had before, and we're going to embed it inside the database system. So now on the application side, when we, want it, when we normally would call 
the PHP code or Python code, whatever it is, to do all those steps. Now we just execute a single SQL query. In this case, it's call. Another system, it's exec or execute. And we just pass in the input parameters as if, as if we're invoking a function. And now it's one round trip to send over that request of what we want to execute. All the queries are, are pre-compiled as, as, as prepared statements. So they're going to run really fast. It runs as a transaction and sends back the final result. So now it's one network round trip back and forth. Right? And this is, this is how you get rid of that overhead of, of, those, the, of a conversational API. So just give you a high level idea of what PL SQL looks like, or, or SQL PSM. Uh, so you have sort of this, this main body of the function or, or the store procedure, and then you have the various constructs you'd expect to have in, in, a, in a regular programming language. Uh, the, this looks a lot like Pascal, if you were ever taught Pascal, like I was in middle school. Uh, I actually don't care so much for the, the, what SQL PSM or PL SQL looks like. Um, the reason why it looks like Pascal is because it's actually based on this other language called Ada, which was, was an extended version of Pascal. And the dude that was on the standards body for SQL who defined what the, pro the store procedure programming language looked like was a huge fan of Ada. So that's why we end up something like this, right? So it has little sort of, again, Pascal things like you have to declare all your variables ahead of time before you actually execute anything. Right? So this, this is just a at a high level what it looks like. All right, so what are the advantages of using store procedures? Well, as I said, we're, we get rid of that, all the extra round trips to execute SQL queries, get back a response, execute a SQL queries, get back a response. And now it's just one request to execute that transaction as a store procedure, and we get back one more result. So that's much, much faster. Um, we're gonna get better performance for our transactions because now the queries can be pre-compiled pre as prepared statements and embedded directly inside the database server, and the database server can invoke those prepared statements directly. Um, from a software engineering side, we get the benefit that we're going to allow our, our, our applications to reuse complex logic um, across multiple implementations, because everything's now embedded in a central location inside the database server. So what I mean by that is, say I have an application where it has some complex function that wants to do something in my database. If I say well, I'm going I'm to rewrite my application and go from, from a Java code to Ruby or Python or have another application that's for mobile devices, I essentially have to then re-implement that logic in every single uh, different platform that I'm trying to deploy my application on. But if I have everything as a store procedure, for this, at least for this complex piece of code, the Python version and the Ruby version and the Java version can all make the same call to the same function inside the database server, and then I don't have to recreate it in those different languages. So that's a big deal. And the other thing is that we, we, you saw this in the, in the case of the silo paper, because all the logic we need to execute a transaction is inside the database server, we can transparently restart transactions whenever there's a conflict without having to go back to the application server and ask it to manually restart the transaction. So what I mean by that is, say I invoke a store procedure, and it starts executing, and then say in the validation phase, it realizes there's a conflict and has to abort that transaction. So typically what would happen in a conversational API, when you abort the transaction, that gets sent back as an exception that is thrown on the application side, and the application server then has to figure out, all right, I had a conflict, my transaction got aborted, I need, I need to retry it. Right? So you need to handle the exception and then know how to go back and retry the thing you, that you were trying before. If it's, everything's on the server side, then if I had a conflict and I had to abort my transaction, I need to go back and re-invoke re, you know, re the, the store procedure from the beginning, and this is all transparent to the, the application server. So your transaction may, may restart 10 times before it actually was able to commit, and the application server doesn't know, and, it, and you don't have to write extra logic to deal with those restarts. So that's kind of nice. So this all sounds amazing, right? Yes? Should application developers write their own procedures and like, register their own database at the very beginning? Your question is, should an application developer write their entire application as a store procedure? For their application, so I mean, if they like, want to make use of the procedures. All right, so I think your question is, uh, since the procedures like uh, are working for their applications logic, so the database have no idea like what they want to do. I think you're asking uh, if I'm writing a new application, do I have to start with everything as being store procedures in the very beginning? Is that what you're... Well, you register the store procedures in the database. Like so, when you say you mean like when the system boots up, or like when the when you're actually developing the application. Like, when you, when you say in the beginning, what do you mean? Like, when you put up the application. 
You know, so, so you install stored procedures, and they're registered in the catalog. So every time you restart the server, they're always there. The stored procedures are written by application developers. Correct, yes. Yeah, this is not, there's no there's research that sort of does this, but there's, there's, there's no magic tool that can take your any arbitrary programming language application and, and decide, here's the boundary of taking this as a store procedure and suck it out and automatically put it in. No, 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 nobody can do that. All right, so this all sounds amazing. And it's certainly in the paper that you guys read in the silo paper and all the other papers we read about concurrent control in this class. Uh, they make a huge assumption, and that is 100% of the transactions are going to execute as store procedures. And this is not true. Uh, we actually did a survey with DBAs last year, and a large percent of them have 0% store procedures, right? And the, the reason is varies about why they don't, they, they don't use store procedures as, as much as we think they do in academia. Um, a big deal is that they have trouble finding people that know how to write PL SQL or SQL P PSM or PLPG SQL, right? Like, it's easy to find a JavaScript Python developer, but finding someone who has experience writing these complex store procedures is, is, is much harder. Now, it's not saying that the language is so archaic that it's, nobody can write it. We're all smart people. We can probably figure it out. But uh, it's not something you come across uh, uh, every day. Now, there are cases where some database systems, like in Postgres, for example, you can write your store procedures in other languages. Like Postgres will let you write, you write store procedures in, in Java, in Python, in, in JavaScript, in Perl. Uh, C, or Oracle will let you write your store procedures in C. Um, but when you want to write in these other languages, because those, are, those other languages can really do anything, the database system has to do th extra stuff to make sure that you don't write a crappy store procedure that takes down the whole system. So for example, in Oracle, if you, you write your store procedure in C, you link it into the database server, when you are trying to invoke that store procedure at runtime, Oracle will fork a process and run your store procedure in a separate sandbox that's separate from the database system, and then has to set up an IPC channel to, to go back and forth, right? Because again, they don't know whether you wrote crappy C code that's going to then start trashing memory and corrupting your database, right? So there are other languages you can write your store procedures in, but you have to sandbox them and protect yourself. From a software engineering side, uh, a big problem is that the the scope of the application now, or, or, the, actually, the entire logic of, of, your, of your application is now broken up into different locations, right? So you're going to have, say you're debugging your program, and you're, you're going along in your debugger, and you're looking line by line, then all of a sudden there's this invocation to a store procedure that you then got to go find where that source code is or in your, in your, and figure out what, what is actually doing inside your database server. And then if you have an agile software development environment where you're may, maybe putting out updates every two weeks, that you may have to change your store procedure every two weeks. And if you're doing rolling updates, now you make sure you have the old version of the store procedure and the new version of the store procedure so that if newer versions of the application uh, want to revoke that store procedure, that they're always running the new one. So now the problem with this is that, and so this last comment here, is DBAs do not like change. So if you're trying to come every two weeks and say, hey, here's my new store procedure, they just don't take whatever code you give them. At least a good DBA just doesn't take whatever code you give them and install it. They will actually vet it to make sure it actually does not going to cause problems with other things running in your database server. So the database server, the DBA is probably not going to let you just have unfettered access to the, the, the database system and let you install whatever store procedures you want. And so the time it takes for when you make a change to your store procedure between the time it actually gets installed could be quite long. So this becomes problematic. And then like, like in SQL dialect in general, uh, nobody really follows exactly the standard so the different store procedure programming languages are not compatible. It's actually even probably worse in, in store procedures than it is regular SQL. So it's, you know, transact SQL definitely just cannot work in, in, in Oracle. All right, so these are, these are definitely not portable. So you're almost really locking yourself in more so than you would with, with regular SQL. All right, any questions about store procedures? Yes. When we run stored procedures locally, then we are avoiding really a lot of network round trips anyway. So how much, do you, like you said in those papers, they were assuming all the queries were as such stored procedures. How much of an impact does it have to have a stored procedure running locally versus a query being issued? So this question is, what's the performance difference from running stored procedures versus running uh, a conversational API when executing transactions? Locally, without a network round trip. Oh, so you're saying if you, if, you, if you just run the application server on the exact same machine as the database server, that is actually not very common. 
right? Most people don't do that, right? Uh, so going over the network is a big deal. Uh, and we'll cover this later, but going through the kernel to send TCP messages is bad, right? There's ways to get around this. We'll, we'll cover that later. But in general, it's, it's, you're going over a physical medium, so it's always going to be slow. Now, I can't give you a number of what, what the percentage is of the slowdown. We're actually trying to run that, those experiments now. But I would definitely say it's, it's non-trivial. The network is slow, right, compared to like running on the same box in memory. So I, I would say it's, it's significant. So again, the reason why I, I, I sort of front-loaded the, the lecture with store procedures is because, as, as I said, the silo paper makes a huge assumption that everything runs as store procedures. And so we'll ignore the issues of, of store procedures are not widely as used as, as maybe people, people think they are for now, and we'll just focus on the protocol. Um, so for this part of the, the, the semester, now we're going to start talking about concurrency control. And so, the concurrency control is essentially the traffic cop or the coordinator inside the database system that's going to figure out how to interleave the operations of transactions running exactly the same time. So before, when we were a disk-based system, we said we had to do this because at any time a transaction could try to touch data that's not in memory, hit a stall because you're going to have to fetch it from disk, and you want other transactions to run at the same time and still make forward progress. So now we don't have uh, disk stalls anymore. But in a modern architecture environment, we have a lot of cores. And we want to try to use all those cores. So we're going to allow multiple transactions to run at the same time on different cores. And so we still have to do all the same protections we had before to make sure that we don't violate the serializable ordering of, of our transactions. Um, and this is essentially what the concurrency control scheme is going to provide for us. So concurrency control is essentially going to allow us to write application code to invoke multiple transactions at the same time um, in a multi-program manner. And all the transactions are going to have the assumption or the illusion that they have exclusive access to the database while they're running, meaning they're not going to see updates from other transactions that haven't committed yet. Uh, and you know, they're, they're, they're not going to get overwritten by other transactions running at the same, running at the same time. Um, and so they're going to think they have, they're running by themselves, even though they're not. And the goal for us, as, as we discussed last semester for concurrency control, was that we essentially want to have this interleaving generate a schedule that is equivalent to uh, one where we execute the transactions in serial order, meaning one after another. And for our purposes, we care about conflict serializability. Right? View serializability is hard to do because you actually have to interpret what the application actually wants to do with the data. So when we say serializable in these lectures, we really just mean uh, conflict serializable. Right? That's what most systems provide. So essentially, the current control scheme is going to provide for us the the atomicity and isolation guarantees that you would have, you want to have in an asset system. And we have to do this because we have simultaneous transactions running on different cores that could all be accessing the same data. So as a quick refresher for the different types of current control schemes that are out there, right? remember I said that there are essentially two classes of protocols. There's the two-phase locking, and then there's the, the, the time step ordering. Every class of current control protocol that I'm aware of has to fall in the, one of these two categories. Now, I didn't make these categories. This, this was, it came out from the early work in the 1980s, late 1970s. So this is not like this is some you know, groundbreaking idea that there's only two protocols. But if anybody comes and tells you, says, I have a currency protocol that's not one of these two, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay? So with two-phase locking, this is also going to be categorized as, as a pessimistic protocol. Right? This is where we're going to assume that transactions are going to conflict. So we're going to require them to acquire the locks for the database objects they want to access before they're allowed to access them. Under timestamp ordering, this is an optimistic protocol, so we're going to assume conflicts are rare. So we're going to have transactions don't need to acquire the locks on the objects uh, at first, and only later on we'll, tr we'll try to resolve whether there was actually a conflict, and then use the, the timestamp we assign those transactions to generate the uh, an ordering of the transactions that's that's equivalent to a serial ordering. So let's go through each of these. So for two phase locking, uh, say we have a simple transaction. It wants to do a read on A followed by a write on B. So in the first phase of two-phase locking, it has to acquire all the locks before it, it's allowed to do anything on those objects. So in this case here, it wants to read on A, so it has to acquire a lock on that. And then it wants to write on B, so it has to acquire a lock on that first. And then this is sort of a super simplified example because we all know there can be different types of locks, right? Shared locks, intention locks, exclusive locks. For our purposes here, we don't care. We just have a single lock per object. 
So this is called the growing phase because this is where you acquire locks uh, that you're going to need in order to execute your transaction. Um, and then later on, when you unlock them, you enter what's called the shrinking phase. So as soon as you unlock one object, you automatically enter the shrinking phase. And now you're no longer allowed to acquire any new locks. So when you're in the shrinking phase, you can only shrink the number of locks you have. You can't go back and acquire more. If you have to do that, you have to abort. And another thing, too, else to say is like, in this example here, it looks like the, the, data, the, the transaction is explicitly calling lock and unlock. In a SQL-based environment, you don't actually do this, right? When you invoke the query, the data system will automatically lock things for you. And typically, they also only do strict two-phase locking, where you only unlock everything at the end. You don't do, actually do explicit unlocks. So two-phase locking was shown to be the first provably correct protocol from the 1970s that came out of, of course, the IBM guys uh, working on system R. Um, so let's see how this works with, with another transaction. So let's say I have two cores in my, in my system. I can run two transactions exactly the same time. So this bottom guy here wants to do a write on B and a write on A. And same thing, in the, in the growing phase, it has to acquire the locks of the object before it's allowed to do anything. And then when it goes and unlocks one of them, it does, it does the shrinking phase. So say, again, I have two cores. I, these transactions start exactly at the same moment in time. And they, these little red arrows represent the program counters. So when the transactions first start off, the very first thing they're going to do is try to get the locks they need. So this guy's going to try to get a lock on A, which, again, no other transaction is running at the same time, so it can do that. This guy wants to get a lock on B. Same thing, nobody's running at the same time, so we can get that. So now we go over here and have, they invoke the first operation. He wants to do a read on A, which he can because he has the lock on A. This guy wants to do a write on B, which he can do because he has a, lock, a write on, a, the lock on B. Then the trouble starts is when we get here. So now transaction one at the top wants to get a lock on B before it writes to it, but transaction two holds that lock already. So it's going to have to stall and wait to try to figure out when, you know, at some later point to, until it can acquire that lock. Transaction two at the bottom wants to get a lock on A, which it can't do because transaction one holds a lock. And then we have what? What is this called? Deadlock, Deadlock right. So at this point here, we have a problem. We can't proceed. Uh, and so we have to do something to, to either break this deadlock or avoid it in the first place. So all the two-phase locking protocols that are out there uh, can be subdivided further based on how they handle their deadlocks. So the first class is called deadlock detection. And the idea here is that we're going to keep this uh, internal data structure to keep track of what locks transactions hold and what locks they're waiting to acquire. And then there's a separate background thread that periodically checks this data structure, usually represented as a graph. And if it sees a cycle, it knows that there's a deadlock, and then it has to make a decision about how to kill one of those transactions to, to break that deadlock. And the dumbest thing you can do is just kill all the transactions, right? But you obviously don't want to do that because you'd be wasting, you know, you know, wasting work. So instead, you're, you're going to try to figure out how to break, kill one of those transactions that then break the deadlock. Then the, the surviving transaction then, then can acquire those locks and then go... Uh, still make forward progress. Or go continue until it commits. And the guy you kill can then try to come back and re-execute itself. So the heuristic you use to figure out what uh, transaction you want to kill can vary in all the different systems, right? You can say what transaction has ran the longest, what transaction has hold, holds the most locks, what transaction has updated the database more, right? All these different heuristics do different things. In the commercial systems like DB2, you can actually can tune, those, tune that heuristic to make decisions about how you break deadlocks. Um, but it, it, there's, no magic, you know, there's no magic formula or algorithm you can use that's going to work best in all situations. It depends on what your application is actually doing. The other approach is to do deadlock prevention. And the idea here is that there's not going to be a separate thread that figures out whether there's a deadlock. It's at the moment that the transaction tries to acquire the lock, if that lock is being held by somebody else, then you make a decision about how to, to proceed. So the choice is either to just wait a little bit for hoping that transaction that holds that lock will free it up, and then you can go ahead and acquire it. Uh, you can commit suicide. Basically, you, you kill your own transaction, give up all the locks that you have, and then go back and restart yourself and try to come back. And hopefully, by the time you come back the second time, that lock you didn't get before is now available. Um, or the alternative is a bit more brutal, where you shoot the other transaction in the head and steal its locks. And then, uh, and then you get to run. Um, again, different systems do different things. No one, no one uh, method or heuristic here is, is, uh, is, is better than others. It depends on the application. Right? If you remember from the intro class, this is all the wait and die, wound wait stuff. This is, this is what's provi provided here. So two-phase locking is will come up later when we talk about multi-version control. 
for this class, we're going to mostly focus on the other class of algorithms called timestamp ordering. So with timestamp ordering, there are no locks. So there's no shrinking phase, there's no growing phase. So instead, what we're going to do in the basic timestamp ordering protocol is that we're going to assign every transaction when it first arrives in the system, we're going to give it a unique timestamp. And this timestamp is going to be used to order, uh, figure out what order those, their operations should have proceeded in, in real time. And we're going to make sure that we don't have transactions reading things in the future that they shouldn't be reading and they're not overwriting stuff that somebody else didn't, didn't get a chance to read yet. So there's a lot of different ways to assign timestamps. For now, we'll just assume that we have a single uh, counter. Like a, a, like we add one to it for every new transaction, and that's its unique timestamp. Right? And then inside the database system, we now need to also maintain two additional uh, pieces of metadata for every single record. So the first is going to be the read timestamp, which is going to correspond to the, last, the timestamp of the last transaction that read this object. It may not have committed yet, just when it was ran, it read it and, and you update this timestamp. And then we'll have the write timestamp is the last timestamp, uh, the timestamp of the last transaction that wrote to this object. And same thing, we can, we can update this before the transaction it commits. So when our transaction starts running and wants to do a read on A, the first thing we have to do is check the read timestamp and compare it against our timestamp to make sure that this is not in the future, right? Because we want to make sure that we can only read things that existed at the moment that we started. So in this case here, 10,000 less than, is less than 10,001, so that's okay. Right? And then we're going to go now update the read timestamp to add in our timestamp to say, I was the last transaction that, that read this object at this timestamp. Then we come along to do a write on B, same thing. I want to check both the read timestamp and the write timestamp to make sure that they're not in the future. So I'm not overwriting something that a future guy did not read yet, and I'm not overwriting something that a future guy overwrote to. In this case here, we're both fine because 10,000 is less than 10,001. So we'll update the write timestamp and say, we updated this object B with a new version, or sorry, a, a new value, and uh, our timestamp was this. So now let's say this transaction goes off and does some other processing. We don't know why, we don't care, right? It could be, uh, it could be going back over the network to get back to the next query, it doesn't matter. But during this time, another transaction came along and they, read, they wrote to object A, and its timestamp is 10,005, which is greater than 10,001, so it's allowed to overwrite this change. Right, so we update its write timestamp. Then our transaction at the top gets back, gets back and starts running again. Now it wants to try to write A again, but now we're going to hit this and say, oh, our timestamp is now less than the current write timestamp for this transaction. So if I overwrote this, then I would be overwriting a value that was written by a transaction that existed in the future. So the way you think of these timestamps, there's like the physical time and the logical time. So in physical time, Another transaction 10,005 wrote to this object and replaced the value. But in logical time, as defined by our timestamps to try to find a serializable ordering, it occurred in physical time before me, but in logical time in the future. And I can't have this thing go back in time and lose this update. So in this case here, since 10,001 is less than 10,005, I can't proceed with doing this right, and my transaction has to abort. Yes. And we're assuming that this new transaction didn't read the value. Right? His quick statement is, are we assuming that this, trans this other transaction did not read the value? It doesn't matter. Well, I'm just thinking, what if it was trying to do something like, I guess if it's inserting fresh, not inserting, if it's modifying values directly, then that makes sense for it to overwrite. But what if it, if it's new write dependent on the previous values? If you wanted to add five. So his statement is, um, if I, uh, if someone read this tuple, transaction 10,005 read this tuple, I would update the read timestamp and maybe inserted record C. And now when I try to do it right here, you're right, I checked this and I would say I can't overwrite this because someone read it at this timestamp in the future and they didn't, they didn't see the update I'm, I'm about to put in. So yeah, you, you, you would fail there. Yes? So if the transaction which wrote uh, uh, 10,005 committed, then it wouldn't matter, right, whether we... You can proceed. So his statement is, uh, in this example here, if 10,005 committed and I try to come back and overwrite A, in theory, I could just drop that write from this guy here uh, because no one read it, 10,005 committed, everyone will see its version, so can I just ignore the write? Yes, that is called the Thomas Wright rule. We'll ignore that for now. But yes, that, that's one optimization you can do. That's the most common one.
Okay, it's more, so the exact protocol doesn't matter. It's more like, I want you to get the idea of understanding that there's these, there are these timestamps we're going to have transactions. And although the physical time of when operations occur may not exactly match what those timestamps are, we can use those timestamps to figure out whether certain things should allow to happen versus others. Yes? How do you make sure when you go to check the timestamps that they're not getting modified by another thread? His statement is, his question is, how do I check to make sure this, these timestamps are not being modified by other threads? So here, here, who here knows what compare and swap is? Raise your hand. All right, 25%. All right, we'll cover this next class. I thought about including these slides. It does come up when we talk about silo. So there's an atomic instruction you can do called compare and swap, where you can say, what's my current value? If it, and then try to update it with, it, with a, a new value. So it's not like you have, I have to have a, 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 like a, a lock or a mutex then have an if clause to, to do the update and then break out of that mutex. In a single instruction, I can update this thing and I, I don't worry about other people updating at the same time. Compare and swap as you handle that. And I'll, I'll cover this next class. All right, so the protocol I just showed you here, it's called the basic timestamp ordering protocol. Nobody actually does this except for Peloton, uh, which for reasons we can take offline, I actually disagree with. Um, but the the... the the big thing that I'm also missing from this, this uh, demonstration is that to ensure that we have repeatable reads, meaning if I read an object at this time and I want to come back and read it again and somebody else in the future may have updated it, to make sure I still see the same value that I read before, I have to copy the, uh, those values into my private workspace. And then it starts to look a lot like the OCC protocol that you guys read about. So again, nobody actually does this except for us for reasons that whatever. Uh, but instead, what everyone does is actually OCC. And so OCC is a variant of, uh, of a t is a, a, this basic time step ordering protocol. And this is also very confusing in databases. Um, so these are all considered time step ordering protocols, and they're also considered optimistic protocols. But there is a specific uh, algorithm or protocol that's specifically called optimistic concurrency control. So the class of these concurrency protocols are optimistic, but one protocol is called optimistic. Okay. So just keep that in mind. We'll just say OCC for short. And so with, with OCC, what we're going to do is that we're going to write, store all our changes in the private workspace. And then instead of checking the timestamps every time we do a read and write to see whether we have a conflict, we'll wait until the very end. And then when we commit, then we check for conflicts. All right. So the, the OCC protocol is pretty old. Uh, it was actually first proposed in 1981 by this guy, H.T. Kong. Actually, this was invented actually here at CMU. Um, H.T. Kong is not a database person. He's actually a networking person. And they just sort of stumbled upon this algorithm and, you know, for, for their networking research and thought it would be actually useful for databases. And this is one of the most seminal papers in, in this area. Um, the only issue about it is, as we'll see as we go along, the things that they use to describe certain aspects of the protocol are not how I would use it to describe them. Uh, like the read phase, you actually can do writes in the read phase, which, whatever. Um, so it's a time step ordering protocol. Again, we're going to write everything work to, into our private workspace. And then when we commit, we're going to check to see at the end whether there's a conflict. So if we go back to our example before. So when we start, we can do a read on A, write on A, and write, write on B. This is the same example that I showed in the other time step ordering example. In our database now, we don't actually need to store the read timestamp anymore. We only need to store the write timestamp. And that's going to be enough for us to figure out whether we're going to have a conflict. So when I, my transaction starts, I want to do a read on A. I'll find, I'll use whatever index I need to find the, the entry that I want, but then I'm going to copy it to my private workspace. And so the OCC protocol is described in phases. So this first part here, when you're actually doing the operations on behalf of the transaction, this is called the read phase. And again, which is confusing because you can do writes in the read phase, but it is what it is. So when I want to read this object, I'm going to end up copying it, find it in the, in the, in the sort of the shared database, the master database, and then I'm going to copy it into my private workspace like an exact copy with the record, the value, and then it's the right timestamp. So now if I go back and anytime I read that same object again, A again, I can always check my private workspace first to see whether it's in there. And if it's not, then I go find it here and copy it into it, right? So now I'll switch over to do a write on A. And instead of going into the, the, the master or shared database, I always go to my private workspace here. And I can always write to it. I don't check for conflicts as I'm doing this. So in this case here, what's going to happen is, we're going to replace the write timestamp, though, with infinity. Because unlike before, under the basic timestamp ordering protocol, 
I got a timestamp when my transaction began. Under OCC, when you start, you don't have a timestamp. You're going to get that later. So at this point, I don't have a timestamp. So when I do my write, I just set it to infinity to say, I don't know what my timestamp is going to be, but I definitely modified this thing. So give me a timestamp later on so I, I know what to put there. Same thing on, on B. I'll first check when I want to do my write. Do I have it in my private workspace? I don't. So then I got to go out in the shared database, copy it in, and then I apply my update. And the same thing, I get, a, uh, I get, I, I get an affinity for my timestamp. So now at this point, the transaction says I want to commit. And unlike in two-phase locking, where you just can pretty much just commit right away because you've already acquired the locks all the, the, that you needed, so all your operations were protected, at, when I call commit in OCC, I have to then switch into two additional phases to figure out whether I'm actually even allowed to commit. Because I was allowed to run at the very beginning without any locks or anything, so now when I commit, i got to check whether uh, this is OK. So the first phase, on the validate phase, is when I'm going to go through my... Uh, I'm going to go through my private workspace and check to see whether uh, I've written to anything that could have been modified or written, modified or read by other transactions either in the past or in the future, depending on what protocol I'm using. And if there's no conflicts, there's no overlap between my write set and other people's read write set, then I enter the write phase where now I apply all my changes from the private workspace into the global database. But at this point here, when I when in the write phase, now I get my timestamp. So now when I write my changes from the private workspace into the shared database, I can update the write timestamp with the one I was given up above. All right, is this clear? Again, there's three phases. Read phase, you do all your reads and writes, update the private workspace. The validate phase, we'll do some checking to see whether we're allowed to commit. We'll, I'll show what that is in a second. And the write phase is, if I pass the validation phase, then I can apply all my updates. And at that point, I get my timestamp. And then I go and kind of commit, and I can blow away my private workspace. All right, again, so the, this basically repeats everything I just said. So in the read phase, again, we're doing all our reads and writes, and everything always targets the private workspace. Right? If we don't have it in our private workspace, then we go get a copy from the shared database, and we bring it in there. Now on the validation phase, this is where we're going to check to see whether we have a conflict from our read write set in our private workspace with other transactions that have, have, have either run in the past or still running now. So there's essentially two ways to do this. There's the backward validation and forward validation. So in the, I think in the intro class last semester, I only covered one of these just because to keep it sort of simple. Uh, but in the actual protocol, you can actually implement both of these. So the backward validation, the way it's going to work is that we're going to look to see whether our read write set overlaps with any transaction that had ran in the past and is already committed. So say we want to commit, oh, sorry, we want to commit transaction two. And so at this point in time, when I want to commit, I have to look back to say what other transactions have, have committed before me and look at the read write set and essentially see whether I overlap with them. And you can do this by looking at the write timestamp uh, that's in the shared database and see whether there's, you know, whether you, you read or wrote something that is correct. So in this case here, this, what is called the validation scope for this transaction is considered this point in time back just for this transaction up here. This other transaction three, at this point in time, is still running. So it hasn't committed yet. So we don't, we don't need to check anything that it did. We don't need to check these, all these other guys. With forward validation, it's the reverse. So the same thing. We want to commit transaction two at this time here. So we only need to look at transactions that are still running in the future, right? So they will commit some point in the future, and we need to decide whether we have written to anything that they read or wrote to in their transaction, and therefore that would cause a conflict when they go to commit. So either one is, is, is the same. It's really about making sure all the transactions do their validation in the same direction. So you can't have some transaction do backward validation, someone do forward validation. Everyone has to always go in the same direction and this is enough to guarantee that your, 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 your ordering is serializable. So sort of, sort of think about this. The four validations is one to sort of think about. Right? So at this point in time when I commit, I don't know anything that this transaction actually did yet. And I don't care. So if I wrote to something here, and this transaction is going to read it, but it doesn't read it to here, then that's fine. Because when I commit, then it'll go and read my latest change. And that's, that's correct. If I wrote to something here, and then this guy read, read that same object, since at this point here, my transaction hasn't committed yet, 
So my updates from my private workspace have not been installed into the shared database. When it, this transaction at the bottom did a read, it would read the old version, the old value. Because, I, you know, again, it, this thing didn't install any updates. So in that case here, I would have to abort my transaction, and then this guy would be able to proceed because it would have looked at the, the state of the database as it existed before this guy made any change. So again, the key here is everything always goes in the same direction, and you check to see whether there's any intersection between the read-write sets of these different transactions based on what direction you're going. Yes? Um, can you do an OCC where it aborts like other transactions instead of aborting yourself? His statement is, can you do OCC where you abort other transactions instead of yourself? So at this point here, I can't abort this guy. He's already committed. He's gone, right? Uh, for forward validation, yeah, you, I think you, that, would, that would be correct. You could still do that. Um, and then certainly when you, when, you do, uh, when you do this in parallel, you end up aborting other people as well. Yes? Uh, how do you deal with a check and miss situation here? Your question is, how do you deal with a check and miss? What do you mean by that? Yeah. You check basically if you have true parallelism, it could be the case that you are checking some transaction, and once you said it's okay, the transaction at the same time reads that thing. All right. So, so his, his all right. So his statement is, why I'm doing validation, someone else, like I, I do my check. There's no, there's no overlap in the read set, so I think I'm okay. Then I try to do my. Uh, then actually then do the read, and I'm, I'm not going to get the new version because I haven't installed the updates yet. Yeah, you have to make sure uh, you acquire latches on the tuples to make sure that doesn't happen. And we'll see this in silo. Okay, so the example I've showed here and then how we teach this in the intro class is, is, is what's called serial validation or single thread validation. So there's essentially a single global, uh, global latch a critical section that, that the data system uses to require that only one transaction can enter the validation phase at a time. Um, in a modern system, th th you wouldn't actually do that. So with parallel validation, essentially what happens is that not only do you need to check other transactions in the past or in the future while you're doing validation, you also have to check the other transactions that are validating at the same time and see whether you have, you have an overlap with them. And so the way you're going to do this, and we'll see this in silo, is that you essentially acquire locks and latches for the records in some fixed global order, and that avoids any deadlocks. So I, I, need to, I need to validate records A and B. I have two threads. They're both going to try to acquire the, the right lack, latch or the right lock on A. If one guy gets it and the other guy doesn't, then that, the other guy knows that, well, somebody else updated it too, and I go ahead and kill myself. Uh, and then because I'm always doing this in, in a fixed order, like in lexicographical or primary key order, it's not like one transaction is acquired B and then A, and the other tries tries to get A and then B, if everyone always gets A first and then B followed by that, then there can be no deadlocks and we don't have to do any coordination or have a separate thread. Question. Yes? So we're assuming that we're using uh, store procedures. So his, state, his question is, are we assuming that we're using store procedures for this? Yes, for silo, for this discussion, yes. But the protocol still works exactly the same as if you had a conversation with API. There's no difference. It's just faster with, a, with, a, with store procedures. Yeah. If you use like a conversation or protocol, um, you you end up having <laughs> because you can you can only know if the transaction is set or not at commit time. Yes. And wait before you keep the commit, you could potentially read some value that that will be corrupted. Uh, so his statement is you can end up reading some value that could be corrupted. What do you mean by corrupted? That's a, that word actually means something very specific, right? That means some other transaction can modify that value, and if you read that value and read it into application. You can't, right? So his statement is, could you, read a could you have a dirty read? Could you read an object, a value, from a transaction that has not committed yet? No, because all your updates from other transactions go into the private workspace. And the private workspace is private. No other transaction will read into that. So they're always going to read the shared database, and that's always going to be a value that was created by a transaction that successfully committed. Right? You have, to get back to, you have to get past the validation phase before you get to the right phase. So when you get to the right phase, you apply all your updates, and you know your transaction is committed. The question I thought you were going to ask was, does this mean that uh, you could execute a, lot of, a, a really long transaction with a lot of queries doing a lot of updates, right? And then only when you get to the validation phase, you realize, oh, I have a conflict for the first query I executed, so I have to abort and roll back and waste all my work. And the answer is yes. That's a big difference between this and two-phase locking.
two-phase locking, you can never have that because if you have a deadlock or issue on the first query you execute, you would know that right away. Whereas in uh, OCC, you have to wait to the very end to figure out whether you're actually allowed to commit or not. All right, so then the right phase is basically, as I said, you just apply all your updates and make them visible to the transactions. And because we're going to use write latches or write locks on the individual records, this ensures that they are they are, are, are atomically visible to all transactions. So nobody, no, no, one transaction commits and does two updates. No other transaction will be able to see one update and not the other. They'll see all at the same time because you have to acquire the write latches on the records before you read them, which is cheap because we need to compare and swap. So another big thing that we don't cover in the intro class, but is, is, is super pivotal to this discussion here, is how the hell do you actually get timestamps, right? In my example before, I basically said that, oh, you just have a single counter, you add one to it, right? And you can protect it with a mutex. And again, if I die and I have a tombstone, put mutexes as your enemy, right? That's the worst possible thing you can do, right? Because mutexes are really slow, because if you have a contention or a conflict on them, which you would if you have a lot of transactions trying to update the same counter, your threads are gonna, it's gonna end up being a syscall down into the kernel, right? Because the operating system has to know not to, 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 know to deschedule your thread, and that's gonna be really slow. So mutex is the worst option. Uh, you definitely don't wanna do that. The alternative is to use an atomic addition. So this is the compare and swap thing I said before. So you have a single memory location uh, that has your counter, and then you can go call, call compare and swap to add one to it. And you basically have a while loop that says, if I do compare and swap and I fail, I come back and try to do it again. So that's really, really fast, because it's, again, it's a single instruction. But the issue is that if you have a lot of cores that are all trying to update this single timestamp, Every single time you do an update, then you, the, the CPU has to send cache and validation messages across the, the, the hardware, across the, the, the either different sockets or the different cores, to invalidate that cache line that has that value because it got updated. So if you have a ton of different cores running transactions at the same time, and they're all trying to do this atomic add on the single counter, uh, you're not going to get good performance. It's, this is actually going to end up being on bottleneck. A way to fix this is actually what's used in silo is to use the batch atomic addition. So instead of doing plus one, plus one, plus one on this counter, you can do plus 10 or plus 20. So now a, a, a thread running on a core can get 20 transaction or time, timestamp IDs, transaction IDs all at once, and then hand them out locally to every th single th transaction that starts. And only when it runs out of timestamps that it goes back and asks some other, the central counter for the next batch. Right, so that solves that problem. But the problem with this one is that if you have a uh, certain, there's a certain degenerate case where you could have a transaction at running at one core that has a higher timestamp than everyone else. So, and, and, it, and it conflicts with this one transaction that's running on another core with lower timestamps because their batch is lower. You could burn through all your timestamps because every single time you restart, you're going to conflict with that other transaction. That other transaction is always going to have a higher timestamp than your batch, and you can burn real quick, real quickly through your batch, and you have to keep going back. So now. Two alternatives are to use uh, a hardware clock, and we'll see this in the Cicada paper next week. This is a new instruction that Intel added, where basically they have a single, they have a clock that's guaranteed to be in sync across all cores, and you don't have to do any cache and validation messages. You just go, you just call this instruction and read and read this clock. Um, and it's not a hardware clock. In sorry, it's not a, a physical clock, meaning like corresponding to the wall clock time. It's just the, the, the a number of instructions in nanoseconds. Uh, since the process started. And then a, a, an alternative that doesn't exist, but something we implemented in, in a simulator we built, uh, is a hardware counter. Essentially, think of this as a central single uh, value in the center of the, of the CPU that everyone can, can do an, a plus one on very efficiently with a single instruction. And you don't have to do any cache and validation because it's sort of treated as a, as a special register. So again, this doesn't exist. This is something that we proposed in, in, a, in a paper that we wrote. So just to give you an idea of the performance you can get with these different methods. So this comes from a paper that I wrote with a PhD student back at, at MIT, uh, doing an evaluation of different current control protocols on a CPU simulator with a thousand cores. So you can't buy, you know, you can't buy a CPU with a thousand cores. These guys at MIT wrote one, this thing called Graphite that could simulate, uh, simulate one. It would run on like, like 50 machines and it run like 10,000 times slower than the wall clock time. Right? So even though it was a single socket CPU, at least the simulator, it had to run on 50 machines even actually get this thing to run. And so what you see in this graph here 
you see a, a single sort of a, a multiple threads, or you're scaling up the number of threads that are all trying to allocate timestamps at the exact same time. It's just, it's just a while that it goes through and says, "Give me the next timestamp over and over again." And so what you see is the mutex case, which I said, which I said is the worst and you should avoid. This is a good example why, because you can never really go past maybe like two or three uh, million timestamps per second. And as you add more cores, it gets worse and worse because the invalidation traffic from this uh, compare and swap operation overcomes the, the CPU. The one that actually works the best is the, uh, the hardware clock, which actually does exist in Intel CPUs. But you can see how these other, the, the batch mechanisms help a little bit, but then if, if you add more contention, then the, again, the cache coherence traffic starts to hurt you. So the, the only issue with the hardware clock, this seems like clearly the one you wouldn't want to use, the only issue with it, if you go read the errata from Intel, they had this language that sort of says, yes, this is, this, is, this is the new instruction we're adding, but it may not exist in future CPUs. So tread lightly in some ways, right? Uh, but as far as I know, the latest versions of Xeons all have it. So it's fine and we use it and it works, all right? So this is to show that you never want to use mutex. The silo batching thing does help a little bit. I mean, actually, I would say it's, it's very unlikely you really need 100 million timestamps per second, right? That's a high number. Uh, but that's, that's where you would sort of fall off up there. Anyway, all right, so now with this, now with, with basic OCC and with ways to efficiently allocate timestamps, now we can talk about in the remaining 20 minutes, uh, the modern protocols. And in particular, the one I want to focus on is the silo one that you guys read, uh, because in my opinion, this is a, this is, when this paper came out, this was, this has made a big impact and it's been very influential. So Silo is a single node in-memory old to be data unit system. Um, it's going to do serializable OCC with parallel backwards validation, and it's only going to be able to execute store procedures. So the paper was, was published in SOSP, which is the, the top systems conference, not a database conference. So there's certain things in the paper that they use to describe uh, certain things that normally in a database world, we say one thing, they say something else. So they don't say store procedures, they say like a one-shot API, but it's basically the, the, the same thing. And then when they talk about the different phases of the protocol, I think it's like phase one, phase two, phase three, right? That's the read phase, validate phase, and write phase that we talked about before. So the key idea about uh, Silo, uh, the, 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 the motivation of the system's design is based on this observation that they want to avoid any writes to shared memory for any, for any read-only transactions, right? Uh, and by doing that, that's allowing you to get better scalability on a sort of a multi-core multi -core system than you would if, in, in a, you know, if, if you, if you did, weren't careful about how you organize things. The other thing is that they're going to do, they're going to use the batch timestamp allocation that I said before, and they're going to organize the, 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 the notion of time in the system based on, on epochs. So the reason why I had you guys read Silo is because this is going to come up, the system is going to come up again when we talk about logging because they have a really good paper on how to do efficient logging uh, that, that we're going to focus on. And there's other aspects of the system that are going to come up in other parts of the, of the system we talk about, like how to do garbage collection with epochs, right? I also like Silo because uh, Eddie Kohler, the guy that helped, uh, the professor that worked in the system helped write it and was on the paper. He's a, he's a professor at Harvard. He's probably one of the best system professors in the world right now, right? Because not only does he come up with awesome ideas, he actually slings code. And if you look at his GitHub commit history, he's always writing code all the time. If you ever use hot crap to submit a paper, uh, like the online submission website, that's written by Eddie Kohler. Um, in the 1990s, he wrote a lot of X11 games that ended up getting ported to weird places. Like he wrote his own version of Mahjong. And then for a while, if he played Mahjong on the airplane game like system, that was Eddie Kohler's version of Mahjong. Um, so he's, he's awesome. Uh, What's really, this paper has been really influential, even though it wasn't even published in SOSP, there's been a, a ton of research in database conferences trying to improve uh, Silo. So this is a, this is the, the program list uh, or for a, a session at Sigma 2016 that I chaired on transactions. And three out of the six papers were based on Silo. So they were, took Silo and tweaked it in some way to try to make it faster, right? My paper is the other one and these other two are, are completely separate things. Right? So there's been a ton of papers since Silo has come out where people try to improve it in you know, various aspects of it. But at, at its heart, the system is pretty solid and it's, it's, it's very, very fast. Just to give you an idea how crazy or awesome that Eddie Kohler is, uh, 
uh, he doesn't trust anybody else's code. So if you look at the silo source code, or for Mastery, the, the index he built for silo, he basically wrote everything himself, right? Like, if I need, a, you know, if I need to parse JSON, I'll just find an open source JSON parsing library and just use that. He didn't trust anybody else, so he wrote his own JSON parsing library just for his database system, right? That's that level of, uh, I want to say craziness, that's the level of dedication that, that I, I highly admire. Okay, so the core idea of, of Silo is that it's based entirely around these epochs. So what's going to happen is it's going to divide the notion of time into these fixed length epochs that occur every 40 milliseconds. So I asked them, why did they pick 40 milliseconds? Is there any special meaning behind that number? They said they just picked it and it worked, and so they, that's what they used, right? But so, it, so the epoch can be any length. They just have to use 40. So what's going to happen is that uh, all the transactions are going to start within this, that start within the same epoch uh, will be committed together in a batch at the end of the epoch. So unlike in regular OCC that I showed before, your transaction can start at any time and commit any time, right? Under silo with the epochs, you can start with any time within the epoch, but when you go to commit, you, you have to wait until the epoch ends before you're allowed to commit. And so what's going to happen is that at the end, end of, the, of the epoch, that's when they actually do all the validation and, and check to see what, you know, what's the correct ordering of, of these transactions. And the idea here is that since we want to reduce the amount of reads and writes to shared memory while the transaction is running, we don't let them do, do any validation and any coordination during their normal execution. It's only at the epoch that we pay this big penalty to go read a bunch of stuff in, across the different cores. But because we're doing it all at once, we don't slow down the regular execution of transactions uh, during, during the epoch. So again, the core idea is that the threads only need to synchronize with each other at the beginning and the end of each e epoch. Now, they do have to handle the case where if you have a transaction that is longer than 40 milliseconds, you have to do some extra stuff to make sure you refresh the epoch so that it gets moved over into the next one. And the paper talks about how to do that. So the way they're going to allocate timestamps is through batches, as I said before. And so there'll be one thread that's dedicated as the epoch thread. So it's responsible for figuring out when the epoch ends and, and, and fin starts and finishes. So it has its own little counter that it, it controls. So again, you don't have to do any invalidation every time you update this with a compare and swap. So it, sets, it says, I have a new epoch. Here's the epoch number. And then it sends out to all the different worker threads they're batches of timestamps that they can use for transactions that, they assign, that, that are running locally to them. And the idea here is that at no point when, when, when this worker is executing transactions, does it ever have to coordinate with anybody else because it got its batch of timestamps at the beginning. Now, if you run out, you can always go back to the epoch uh, thread and ask for more, but it, you, know, you, you want to avoid that as much as possible. So now the same thing. When the epoch changes, right, you, you, you increment it, then you go out and send the message to everyone else. That says, All right, this epoch has ended. Here's the new one. Everyone does their validation to see whether transactions can commit. So let's look at the commit protocol. So for every single tuple, I'm going to prefix it in the header with a transaction ID word. So basically, they're, they're packing in a bunch of extra data within a single 64-bit word. So you're going to have the epoch, the batch timestamp right, for, for every unique transaction within a batch running at that core. Uh, and then you some extra metadata to keep track of the write lock or latch, whatever you want to call it the latest version bit, which you can ignore for now, and then an absent bit to say whether this thing's actually been deleted or not. Right? So we can pack all that in within a si single 64-bit uh, integer. So now if I have executed a transaction here, let's say this transaction ran, and it did a bunch of reads and writes, so it now has updated its, its, uh, its read set and write set in its private workspace, then now it wants to go and commit. We need, we need to do validation to see whether we're actually allowed to, 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 to apply our updates into the database. So the first thing we have to do is you need to lock in the, uh, in the shared database the, the tuple we modified to make sure that no other transaction, no other thread tries to do, do the update at the same time. Right? So this is being done on, on, the, on the, uh, the validation phase at the end of the epoch. So in this case here, we, we can go grab the lock on this guy, right? and that's fine because nobody else has got it. We, we do a compare and swap to try to get it. If we can't get it, then we abort ourselves and roll back, right? and we, our transaction has failed. So in this case here is we got it, so we can proceed with the next step, where we want to examine the read set to make sure that uh, we read the correct version, that nobody else wrote to something that we should have read. So for this, we can check the, uh, the transaction word that's embedded in the header in the read set and check to see whether uh, the 
epoch timestamp inside of the, the tuple that's in the shared database is less than that. And so to do this, we have to acquire a, uh, the, the latch to do this quick check. Um, if we can't acquire that latch, then we know that somebody else is, is, is updating at the same time we're trying to validate it. Validate it. So we, we have to roll back, roll back and fail. So in this case here, that worked fine. Uh, the other transaction was trying to do this. Then we try to validate this guy. We would see that we already hold the latch for this. So we know that it's ours and we're allowed to go ahead and, and we were able to read it. So we don't worry about anybody else trying to update it at the same time. And then now at this, we've done our validation. We know that everything's correct. So now we can install our write set. So we'll just uh, copy then our update into the, the shared database. And then once we're done, we can, we can release the, the lock um, and all our updates get installed. And again, we'll do that same ordering that I said before, where we make sure that we, we order the, the order that we acquire the locks into the shared database is in the order of the like the transaction tuple or sorry the tuple ID or the record ID or the primary key. So that way, all the threads are trying to acquire the locks in the same order. And then we, when we release the locks after we apply our updates, we do we do it in reverse order, right? Again, to, to avoid deadlocks. Another big aspect of this is how to do garbage collection. Uh, so Silo is going to do what's called cooperative garbage collection. So the threads that any object that was created by a thread, that thread is responsible for deleting. Right? In other cases, when we talk about MPCC, we'll see that other threads can delete other objects from, made by other threads. Um, for our purposes here in Silo, we only can delete things that we did, that, that we modified. So the key idea of how this is going to work is that we can use what is called a reclamation epoch. So the epochs are going to use, we're going to use those to figure out how to order the transactions. We're also going to be able to use them to figure out when it's safe to delete an object. Because we don't want to delete an object and have a thread still looking at that, because then it maybe follows a pointer, tries to actually interpret that data, and it, it, it'll, it'll get an invalid read and have a problem. So this will come up more when we talk about um, how to do garbage collection in, in index data structures. But at a high level, it's basically the same thing, right? And th this uh, it's called RCU in, 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 in the operating system. But the basic idea is, again, we use these epochs to figure out when it's safe to actually delete things. So we'll cover this more uh, uh, next week. For range queries, uh, these are also something that you have to handle because uh, you can guarantee serialize will order by, in OCC by itself if you just make sure you order the updates to the, to the, the shared database correctly. But we can still have uh, range queries done on the index where phantoms could occur, meaning someone deletes something in our range or something adds, somebody adds something in our range, and we try to go back and read that same range again, we would get different results. So the way they're going to handle this, uh, and we'll see this later on when we talk about Hecaton, is that they're going to keep track of the scan set of, of, of how of what nodes the transaction read on the index. Then when you go to commit and when you do, do validation, you go basically go back and do the exact same scan again on the index and see whether you get the same result. If you don't, then you know that somebody else did something that modified your range uh, before, you know, since the last time you ran it. If you want to insert something, you can put in virtual entries to say, hey, I'm going to insert this key in here. I haven't actually committed yet, so don't actually put the value in. But that will prevent somebody else from trying to insert something at the same time. So again, we have to do this because whenever we have indexes, we still have to maintain serializable order, even if queries that touch the indexes. So that's why they do this extra stuff. There's other ways to do this, like key range locking, index gap locking, and we'll cover that uh, next week when we start talking about indexes. So there's one graph I want to show you uh, from the paper. Uh, and the reason why I like this graph is it's a good example of, of a sort of scientific experiment that is run on a different machine that corroborates results done in, a, in another investigation or, or in another paper. So in the, in the side of the paper, they talk about this notion of a partition data store. Um, or they, met, they reference HStore or VoltDB, which is the system I help work on. Uh, and the basic idea here is that we're going to split the database up into shards or partitions, and then we'll have a single thread to execute all transactions at that partition. So, so it's, it's single thread, it means only one transaction can run at a time. And if you have to touch multiple partitions, you have to acquire the locks in those two partitions before you're allowed to start running. And so what they show is that when you have zero multi-partition transactions or cross-partition transactions, so this means that at this point in the graph, 100% of the transactions only need to touch one partition. So if you use the H-store model or what they call the partition store, that gets the best performance. 
But as you increase the number of cross-partition cross transactions, the performance gets much worse. Because now I have to lock every single partition, and because I'm single-threaded, no other transaction can run at the same time. So I could hold lock for the entire cluster, and they only have to update maybe one or few, you know, a, a one record per partition, but I still have to acquire all those locks, and nobody else can keep, keep on running. So what it shows is that around, in their case here, around 15%, uh, when you have 15% cross-partition transactions, the regular silo implementation actually uh, gets better. So if everything's single partition, the HTML model works the best, but then when you have more multi-partition transactions, the, the performance of silo is stable. And so what I like about this is that I, when I ran my own experiments with the HR system we built, we would exceed the exact same measurement, right? So around 12 to 14% multi-partition transactions in your workload, the performance would, would start, start, start to tank and fall, fall apart. So again, it's a nice example. They had a completely separate system implement the same algorithm we implemented, uh, and they got the exact same result. So I like that. All right, so uh, we have, what, five minutes left? Um, yeah, I'm not going to get through Silo or, or TikTok. That's way too complex. Um, so let's, let's just skip ahead. We'll finish up. So any questions about Silo? Yes? Uh, so you know, in Silo, does it actually need to keep the whole record in a private reset? Because it seems like it just needs to keep the, uh, the ID check it. So, so, so his question is, um, do you actually need to keep the entire read set in, in, in sorry, the entire tuple contents in, in your read set? Uh, I don't think they talk about that you could just have the, the record ID, right? They, they mentioned re in reads, they say like, they like spin on a lock coding, like spin on a latch and coding. Um, so, that was like, they were just keeping the ID. So his question is, could you just always read from the shared database uh, yeah. and not worry about making this copy into here? Um, yes, but it also depends on where this, this data is actually stored. So you may want to actually just copy it into your private workspace because the, the share, that portion of the shared database for the, for the object you want to read might be on another socket. So going over the QPI to that other socket would be really expensive. Um, Whereas it, that, reading this from your local cat, like CPU cache, would be really fast. I, so from a correctness standpoint, it would still work, but for you know simplicity, you can go either way. Okay. So again, I, that that was a bit rushed. Um, I think the core thing to remember in case of silo is this notion of epochs, the notion that you're trying to avoid the the rights to shared memory only until you have to actually do do the commit. And then for the garbage collection stuff, we will uh, we will we will handle that um, when we talk about indexes later on. So the 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 other uh, the other the thing I'm skipping over is this uh, OCC implementation called TikTok. And at a high level, what I'll say is what they do instead of having this separate epoch thread uh, handle out these timestamps for transactions, you actually can derive the timestamps for for tuples or sorry, timestamps for transactions based on the tuples that they read and write. And that sort of has a decentralized way of allocating timestamps without having a single thread manage everything. But at a high level, it's still doing OCC. It's still doing the, the, the read phase, write phase, and validation phase. All that's still the same. All right, so the major trade-offs we're going to have OCC versus other transactions is that, sorry, other concursion protocols is that uh, with OCC, we basically have no runtime overhead uh, very little runtime overhead while the transaction uh, is running, but we don't find out whether the transaction is going to actually be able to commit or not when we actually go to do validation. So if you have a, a workload with a lot of contention where everybody's trying to update and read the same thing, then you could end up doing a lot of work that ends up getting wasted and you end up rolling back. In, uh, in OCC, there are some ways, some methods to actually do partial rollbacks and partial reordering of operations um, but that, as far as I know, they all require program analysis, so they're not, uh, they're not easily extendable, they're not easily uh, implemented. And as I said before, Silo is a very influential system that even today people are still trying to crank out more papers, making it run faster, which I, to me is not very exciting, but other people do it. Okay, um, for next class, we're going to now switch over to multi-version concurrency control. So I gave a sort of a crash overview of two-phase locking,
and we spent more time at OCC today. Um, both of these protocols we can then implement when we actually do a multi-version environment. So the paper you guys read for Wednesday will cover not only the concurrent geo protocol to do uh, multi-versioning, but also all the other design decisions you have to deal with when you uh, build a, a multi-version database system. Because most of the papers that are out there only deal with, here's how to do OCC or two-phase locking with MVCC. But you have to worry about the indexes, you have to worry about garbage collection, you have to worry about how you actually maintain pointers between different versions when you build a system. And so the paper you guys are going to read is actually one of my favorite papers that I've, I've ever written, right? And I think so highly of this paper that when we submitted it, we called it the, the best paper ever. And the reviewers came back, and this was the, 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 the main thing they complained about. It says, please remove this is the best paper ever from the title, revise it. Um, we went through multiple iterations, so I'll show you on, on, on Wednesday. But it, <laughs> and the title is like something very banal, or like the empirical evaluation of multiverse control, right? It's something, the title does not do the paper justice. Let me put it that way. Um, and again, but the reason why I think it's the best paper is because it covers everything that you need to have to build an in-memory multi-versioning system. And most of the data systems that are out there that have been built in the last 10 years are all doing multi-versioning. And so they all have to make these design decisions that we're going to cover in that paper that no other sort of paper has really covered until now. And I'll say also, too, that this paper came out of this class. So the first time I taught this class, I had uh, uh, three master students and a visiting student, PhD student from Singapore, basically do all the work we needed to do to, to publish this paper. right? So that's why I'm also really excited, too, because it reminds me of the first time I taught the course, and we, we got a paper out of it. OK? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze at escape. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives